Thanks for coming here tonight. I believe there's a, a football match later on. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what that's about. But um, I thought that it might be a nice way to introduce what I always feel when I watch an England football match, which is this feeling of kind of national disappointment and shame sometimes. But I wondered whether in your work, because it focuses so much on America until now, perhaps, whether there is some kind of underlying national disappointment you feel that you find, you know, your government or you, your state is providing all these different things that you, you've investigated throughout your career? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a great question. I, I, first of all, I, there's a couple of people I got to thank, too. I, I first of all, I want to thank Tams and Dylan for first uh, asking me to do this commission, which is fantastic and being great. And also, Thierry, Thierry Ball, where are you? Uh, there he is, <laughs> who, who we did this project together. We're tromping all over the, the landscape in Yorkshire and in Cornwall and all, all sorts of crazy places together, working on this together. And special, special thanks to Rebecca, who's been absolutely fantastic curator to work with and uh, couldn't give anybody higher praise. So I just want to let you guys know, first of all. Um, as, as to the, this question of a kind of national shame, I don't, I don't know. It's a bit I mean, tenuous, I, I, it feels very British kind of question to me. Um, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, I, um, but no, in, in the sense that I, 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 there is, I mean, the U.S. has a global footprint, and I guess I don't even think about it as being constrained by what we would necessarily like traditionally think about as a nation state in the sense that I do predominantly look at American institutions with this kind of work, but those institutions are global, yeah. and they're everywhere, and they are formed through deep collaborations with many, many other countries. For example, the UK, if, yeah. we're, I mean, if we're talking about the NSA, particularly its global operations, it's really quite inseparable from GCHQ, for example. You know, yeah. And you see those kinds of collaborations um, across the globe, and, and I think about these as almost kind of supranationalistic kind of projects rather than, um, you know, obviously they, uh, something like mass surveillance or drone warfare is, um, it's, it's, there's more of a kind of imperial interest than a kind of national interest. So do you, think, do you think it's unfair me picking on America as the big bad guy in this situation because the other countries are doing it Mm -hmm. China and Russia are undoubtedly doing it, but you just happen to be focusing on America. I mean, is that unfair? No, no, it's not unfair. I mean, in the sense that, I mean, picking on America, I mean, that uh, doesn't, I'm not, <laughs> don't have an inch of, you know, uh, sympathy towards the American government. Um, but I, I just mean, I think it's a little bit reductive, mm. just because uh, we do live in a, in a globalized world where by, um, Power is also in coercion, and state um, apparatuses are, you know, especially in the American context, it's very difficult to talk about them as specifically American, mm -hmm. right? And, and part of that has to do with the U.S. of course bullying other countries around, and you know, threatening economic sanctions if Turkey won't let America, you know, use airspace and that sort of thing mm -hmm. to, to fight whatever adventures they're involved with. But um, I, I guess the way that I. I yeah. Having said that, I mean, the, the, the title of the piece is an English landscape and then parentheses, an American surveillance space in Yorkshire. What's it called? American surveillance Harrogate. space near Harrogate, yeah. Yorkshire. Right? And that, but that really was one of the things that I did want to emphasize as well in the, in the language around the project mm. was that in, if you read about this base in the newspaper or something like that, they'll always call it RAF Men with Hill. And I think there is a way in which symbolically there is an attempt by the British government to say, no, this is an RAF base, you know, it's something mm -hmm. that we're doing, and it's not. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is an American base, and so that, that was a little bit of a provocation with and, the piece as well. And tell us, because we're, we're all now um, familiar with the term NSA, yeah. as we are now with GCHQ and many of these other yeah. acronyms, but this particular base is partly, uh, well, it's, it's mainly part of the NRO, is that correct, the National... Yeah. Reconnaissance Office. Yeah, so there's two <coughs> major agencies that are here at this at this base. Um, one is, of course, the NSA, the yeah. National Security Agency. These guys, you know, they're tapping fiber optic cables. This is also 
a place from which a lot of the global cyber warfare operations are done. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, distributing malware or doing you know, kind of computer attacks against other people's networks and that sort of thing. So that's on one hand, the NSA has a very strong footprint here. But actually when you, uh, the kind of iconic signifier of the space is these giant golf balls, as people mm -hmm. call them, these white balls. And those are ray domes, and inside of those are antennas, and they have the ray domes around it to protect the antenna, but more importantly, to prevent a viewer from seeing where the antenna is actually pointed. Uh, okay. So that's what's going. Uh, that's what's inside those things. Right. Those are just shells. Not a giant brain or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Can we look, could we look at slide number four, actually? Because yeah. that might help. Oh, yeah, that's a great. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a, a detail of a part of that, of, of the panorama. And you can see those golf balls a little bit more clearly. And so what each of those golf balls or, or ray domes um, is assigned to a particular satellite. So the US has a fleet of over 200 uh, reconnaissance satellites in orbit around the Earth. And if they want to control ones uh, predominantly over the Middle East, they can't do that from the US because there's not a line of sight. So they'll use, um, so these are basically the uh, ground station mm -hmm. for classified American reconnaissance satellites. And the agency that controls those is an, another intelligence agency called the National Reconnaissance mm -hmm. Office. And the National Reconnaissance Office I think the best way to think about who they are is they're like a secret version of NASA. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not even an exaggeration. I mean, they have about the same budget as NASA, but the existence of the National Reconnaissance Office wasn't um, officially acknowledged until 1992. It was formed in 1960. Um, so for you know, however many decades, the US had a completely secret space program mm -hmm. and space agency. Mm -hmm. Uh, now everything they do is still secret, but the uh, but they acknowledge that the mm -hmm. agency exists, and so they they also have a major footprint here. In in, in the internal literature de describing this space, in the net in the National Reconnaissance Office literature, they call it the Harrogate Ground Station, and in the in, in the NSA literature, they call it MHS Menwith Hill Station. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, it was a surprise to me. I know it's it's one of these things. It's hiding in plain sight. It's there, and they're not necessarily trying to hide it. But wh what was your feeling with um, putting it in the underground in this way? What, what was your intent? Because what we have is this amazing panorama that goes through these arches, these kind of Arcadian views that you get glimpses of at the tube station. But what you're actually glimpsing is, you know, a kind of traditional Yorkshire moors, kind of an idyllic, you know, some little stone houses, and then this kind of strange alien quality that goes over the top. I mean, it looks almost kind of too, too strange to be real, but what was the effect that you wanted to achieve yeah. by kind of yeah. putting I mean, them maybe together? Maybe we could look at slide three really quickly. It gives us a little bit more of an overview of the whole thing. So this installation really emerged from the specificities of the site. So when I started looking at um, uh, projects that other artists had done and started looking at the space and, and came and visited it. One of the things that struck me was that um, were the arches and were the columns and they reminded me of, you know, the, these, yeah, like these Arcadian -like kind of landscapes where you have the, the columns and part of the painting is seen through the columns. So the, so I had the idea was, well, what if we thought about them rather than making an individual piece of art for each panel, what if we thought about them, the columns being a kind of foreground and that you'd be looking out into a landscape and kind of would that work and was that technically, technically possible and also aesthetically would that sort of work? And so I basically just built the digital model of the whole tube station and kind of started playing around with mm -hmm. it and, and thought that it would. And then, of course, thinking about what the content of that landscape would be, I, you know, again, just being in the UK, I started thinking about, okay, well, let's think about the British landscape tradition, you know, mm -hmm. painting and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And what would, what would that be now, right? And yeah. so, I mean, Yorkshire is like a classic kind of British landscapey kind of place. And in the middle of Yorkshire is, yeah, these giant golf balls in, the, in this massive surveillance space. And so that was really, I thought that that would be interesting to shoot it and to compose it in a, in a very traditional style, but then you, you, you would have this kind of 
alien presence. And, it, and it's interesting, that word alien. It's come up a number of times for people, because it, it looks like these aliens have landed in Yorkshire. And there's just a, a massive contradiction between uh, the historical associations that we have with those landscapes that we've seen reproduced in, in paintings and photographs and, and so on, and the, the, the presence of this base. And, and I guess the word aliens come up a lot because a lot of people say like, oh, it's as if aliens had landed in this bucolic landscape. And one of the kind of things that I wanted to suggest is actually these are not alien at all. These are, you know, they belong just there just as much as you yeah. know, the stone churches and that sort of thing. We just yeah. kind of bracket that out kind of culturally from our perceptions of that landscape. If we could just skip to slide five, because what I also liked about some of the research that went into the idea of yeah. the pastoral or the idyllic is the kind of classic British landscape. So John Constable, who didn't really paint in Yorkshire, although, yeah. you know, I think you were going for the tonalities and the idea that, I mean, does it often feel like we talk about these as works of kind of romance or sublime? You know, is that what you were aiming for as well? This kind of edge of not quite that. You know, there is an irreality to a lot of um, British landscape painting, and, and yeah. we'll look at some other ones in a minute that are even more kind of fantastical. But I don't know. What, what, what is it about the English landscape that, you know, there's something incredibly romantic to to these paintings, but I don't know, there's the, the tonality in your work seems to suggest there's something more yeah. sinister going on. Than yeah, I mean, I guess that these paintings for me, um, they don't feel so much as sublime as like highly curated in a way in terms of highly manicured landscape. These are landscapes that somebody owns and wants to show off to you, you know, right. and, you know in, in an image like this. You know, we see the the manor or wh whatever where the rich person lives who owns the land is sort of in the background, kind of haunting yeah. the landscape as if, you know, he's like, oh, it's very, I'm going to be subtle, but I'm going to make sure you know that I own it, yeah. <laughs> you know, in terms of the, the rhetoric <clears throat> of the image. And, and that's also something that I kind of wanted to play with a little bit in terms of what, if, if, if you took an image like this, and instead of have it being, you know, the Lord's house or whatever it was in, in the background, it was you know, the, the NSA kind of yeah. listening. Well, uh, listening I know, balls, I know from know? Um, someone who's in the audience tonight who grew up in that area telling me about when she was a kid kind of seeing the, the presence there. You know, there's yeah. obviously a, an MOD, there's a Ministry of Defense yeah. presence there, but I guess it is an American base. It, you yeah. know, must be full of Americans and, you yeah. know, it's, it's not a British scene, you know, in many It's an ways. American colonel who's yeah. in charge of the whole okay. thing, yeah. yeah. Um, but they, there are British people that work there. Yeah. I mean, I was being a little bit hyperbolic in saying that the, the British have nothing to do with it. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there are uh, some British people stationed there as well. Yeah. And could we then go to, let's try slide number nine, just for the, yeah. this is Claude, who yeah, this also is Claude, kind yeah. of specialized in the, the fantastical landscape. I mean, we almost have a golf ball there as well. But <laughs> right, exactly. the idea that these things are kind of follies or, or, or things that are, pasted on to to a landscape something that's that's not really that was never really there i don't know whether yeah because you know, you, your work i've, I've talked to, to you briefly about the idea of truth and you're not that interested in kind of some sort of basic truth yeah no i think i mean for me these images were i mean they're obviously a major influence on british landscape painting but I guess also what I was looking at with these is, you know, looking at the columns and what, how do the columns kind of function in relation to the landscape and why is Lorraine kind of over and over again have these either columns that you're partially looking through or the ruined columns. Mm -hmm. And so that, that just kind of as a motif, that's something that, that jumped mm -hmm. out to me when I was looking at how the tube station was put together in terms of in, in thinking about this. Um, but yeah, I think that there is that tension between the, these, this fantastical seeming architecture of surveillance and this kind of deliberately anachronistic landscape that it lives within. And when I mean say deliberately anachronistic, I mean, I, it's my understanding that in Nor Yorkshire, you can't just build whatever you want. You know, you have to make it look like it's the 19th century if you're gonna yeah. build something there. Yeah, there are, there, are, there, are, there are laws about what you can yeah. or can't build, what kind of stone. 
And to me, it was it was very ironic because we spent a little bit of time in the in the towns and talking to people, and and we found over and over people were complaining about how uh, the wind turbines that were being constructed and you know how they were kind of blemishing the view. <laughs> Just like oh, there's this other thing right over there that is a lot bigger and Bl a lot blotting the landscape. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, I wonder whether also um, what. What's interesting is, you know, you haven't said, well, we've said a little bit about what goes on in these, in these yeah. places, but we're starting to learn more about that through WikiLeaks and, you yeah. know, and, and these kind of um, uh, information and intelligence leaks, as it were. So is that something that you've been, because you've been engaged in these kind of projects for a, a lot longer than, you know, we, we think of WikiLeaks as being something very timely and relevant, but yeah. actually you've been looking at these subjects for a long time. Yeah. I mean, these things are cyclical, I suppose. You know, Ten yeah. years ago, you probably would have said the same thing. Well, <laughs> everyone's talking about NSA, and now we're all talking about it again. Yeah. But the idea that, you know, that these bases might collect intelligence that could actually go into you know, secret rendition or you know, yeah. capturing or killing terrorists or whatever, you know, the, the fact that we're learning about this now, is that, does that change your opinion of it? Or, or it, just, it just so happens that we're a bit more aware of it now? Well, I think, I mean, it's been funny in, over the course of my career or whatever you want to call it, that you know, when I remember like in the mid 2000s, I did an exhibition that had to do with the CIA and, and, you know, I'd been chasing the CIA all over the world working on stuff. And the exhibition came out and people said, oh my God, you know, this is so timely. You know, this is, you know, the, this CIA is just starting to be in the news and people are starting to question some of the mm -hmm. covert operations that the U.S. has been running around the world. And, and then I did a show a couple years later that was photographs of, of drones. We can look at one of those yeah. uh, image number, uh, Let's take a look at image number 15, for example. Um, so I did a, a series of works that was that I was just driving out into the desert in Nevada, where they all the drones, no matter where they are in the world, are flown by pilots in Nevada for the most part. And you, you drive out to the desert there, and you know where to look. You kind of stop your car, and you look up at the sky, and then you realize that there's all these, you know, little, you know robot assassination flying machines flying around. So I was just photographing the skies mm -hmm. there. And then that came out and then the drone started becoming a little bit controversial, yeah. a lot controversial. Yeah. And uh, people say, oh, well, this is so timely. <laughs> you know? and, and so I've been in the business, I guess, of looking at this stuff for long enough that it's it's been funny to me because over and over again, we're seeing uh, variations on similar themes mm -hmm. and then I think kind of collectively like we forget that this is constantly in the news or yeah. constantly uh, having a big influence on the way that uh, global politics are conducted mm -hmm. or, or how violence is um, uh, deployed around the world and, and so that, so that has been kind of interesting to realize that you know even I remember when Bush uh, was 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 out of office and Obama came to came to office you know all, so many of my colleagues were like well Trevor I guess your career is over <laughs> now you That's know, it. it's like we're gonna yeah. enter this new golden age yeah. where you know, everybody's no it's still um, it's still going on yeah but w but I think with the with the NSA uh, stories that have come out like from the Snowden documents I mean that really is an unprecedented look. Mm -hmm into the scope yeah. of, of, of really just a single agency, the NSA. And the NSA is not even the biggest agency in the American intelligence community. Um, and I guess looking at that material, it's been just astounding to see that the reach of the NSA in particular, I mean, like really every fiber optic cable, every cell phone, every app on every iPhone, you know, and, and it's just, jaw-dropping the scale of this stuff mm. and the ubiquity of mm. it. Um, and you know, I was thinking the other day that even one of the things that we learned was that there's a, a classified part of the American intelligence budget, which people colloquially call the black budget. Mm -hmm. And people who in the, you know, among people who do national security journalism and that sort of thing, everybody assumed that the CIA was about the fifth or sixth biggest one. Mm -hmm. Everybody assumed the National Reconnaissance Office was the biggest, the secret version of NASA because launching stuff into space is really expensive. 
Um, everybody then thought NSA was probably second, mm -hmm. and then third would be like Defense Intelligence Agency. And everybody thought CIA was about fourth or fifth, and everybody, it was kind of commonly understood that the CIA budget was about $4 billion. One of the, I think, the stories that hasn't really been picked up that much is the fact that actually the CIA is the biggest um, member of the intelligence agency with a budget of about $16 billion. It's about a third more than the NSA. And looking at the, gr the, the, the degree to which the NSA is everywhere mm -hmm. in the world, it makes you think like, my goodness, what so the heck where is, else CIA is the CIA doing? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I, I read something this morning that kind of hit, um, Zizek writing about is the second anniversary of Julian Assange, yeah. I was going to say going into self-imposed exile, but it wasn't going into exile or prison or whatever he's kind of been forced into, and saying that a bit like how we'd all said when WikiLeaks and when, when some of these other um, documents came to light, that we weren't entirely surprised, yeah. but that when the, the detail came out, and Zizek talks it, about it a bit like knowing that your partner's cheating on you, but not knowing the details, like actually when it happened, where yeah. it happened, yeah. and that's what's starting to kind of frighten people, yeah. or, you know, because I think we all, I don't know, it obviously wasn't a surprise to you, but, you know, you've no, been involved I mean, in this. No, a huge amount of the NSA stuff was a surprise to me, also mm. be precisely for that reason. Mm. I mean, before Snowden, you know, uh, you know, everybody who kind of does journalism about this kind of thought like, hey, there's a secret, we knew that there was a secret interpretation of Section 215 of the Patriot Act, for example, and nobody exactly knew what it was, but the kind of word on the street was that everything counts as a business record, and the NSA feels like that they can look at everything under this one provision of this one law. And then, you know, I'd actually that ended up being one of the first documents that Snowden came out with, and, and it was a big deal, even though you know, people who studied this stuff kind of thought that that's what was true. But yeah, when you have the piece of paper that says, like, no, here's the court order saying that that's how we're interpreting this law, it matters. Well, you, I mean, in, in some of your work, um, you've kind of been responsible for pulling up these kind of documents yourself. You know, you're talking about the black site work you did and the rendition work you did. You know, you're pulling together evidence and documentation um, into some quite sort of powerful documents. What's the difference then in turning that into an artwork as opposed to just being part of, you know, a kind of intelligence community, being part of this you know, yeah. sort of WikiLeaks family. What, what's no. the difference? Yeah. How does it change when you make it an artwork? I am going to have to point out that one of the real pros of that is like right over there, this guy Crofton Black <laughs> from, from Reprieve, a fantastic don't outfit. Out, don't <laughs> out him. Don't out him. <laughs> um, probably knows more about this. He's done a huge amount of work with that and a lot of it, which I've used as well. Um, I think the difference between do looking at some of this material in a journalistic or from a, from a human rights angle is, I guess for me as an artist, I'm looking for allegories. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to find what is the moment where I find a detail that somehow speaks to the whole and doesn't necessarily even mean it's a piece of particularly good evidence that you would use in a court of law or something like that. I'll give you an example. I was working with an investigative journalist named A.C. Thompson, and we did a lot of the research into the renditions together, we were flying around the world trying to figure this stuff out. And one of the things that we were looking at was the CIA had set up a network of fake companies around the world that they were running these covert operations through, and there's reasons why they like to do it through fake companies. Um, but one of the things that we realized very quickly is that the companies were composed out of fake identities. So for example, you would pull the corporate documents and the, they would have a board of directors and a treasury and a secretary. And these would all be people that had a birthday in the 1950s, but a social security number that was issued in the 1990s and who had never had a driver license or a credit rating or anything like that. So like you, Joe Schmo or you yeah, know, they just were just invented. Yeah, they were just invented paper yeah. people. But yet, legally, when you, you know, form a corporation, people have to sign those documents. And so I got obsessed with collecting the signatures of these people who didn't exist because every time that they were signed, the signature was different. Mm. <laughs> and, and it got to the point where, you know, I was flying around the country to go to some office in Tennessee where I could get the signature of this fake company. And my collaborator, this journalist, is like, why the hell are you spending so much time? Like, we know that these are fake companies. Like this is this crap. Yeah. You yeah. Know You're chasing it? But ghosts. Yeah, but for me, it was like... <clears throat> So collecting those signatures was really, really important mm. as a kind of 
metaphor, mm. basically, and a visual one, because you could mm. just see it, and I could say, here's all these signatures, and then instantly you'd say, mm. like, my God, but what the hell is yeah. going on here? You so know? it's one way yeah. is it, it's to relate it to an audience. Yeah. But then I suppose another thing is that, um, you know, you, you're also explaining some of the, the processes that maybe other people take for granted. So you're talking about one of the reasons why you might have this kind of fake company is that it's actually a lot easier to fly a plane to somewhere uh, if you create a shell company, a yeah. non-existent trans transportation company mm -hmm. um, that can you know, then do these missions. Yeah. Because if you're the military and you, you turn up in Kabul or Baghdad and there's a record of your plane, then you, know, you start a war or something. Yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely. so to what extent then, I mean, you know, your methods, you say you work with other people and you collaborate with others. To, kind of, to what extent do you undertake kind of secret missions yourself? You know, how kind of deep do you get? I don't do undertake <laughs> secret missions in the sense that Sorry, I don't that lie about bad, what it know. is that I'm doing or something like that. Right. <laughs> I mean, I, I do spend a lot of time running around the world <laughs> looking at stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's actually a big part of methodologically what I do, I mm -hmm. guess, was, you know, if you're, you know, a journalism or, or a lawyer or something like that, you would you'd find out where different things are, but it's not, you don't necessarily need to go there. And, and that's really a big part of what I do. Every time I find a place, like, I want to go there. I want to mm -hmm. know what it looks like. Um, because a way of seeing emerges mm -hmm. from that, right? Yeah. You know, whether that is looking at some front company that is attached, that is, you know, in the office of a divorce lawyer, for example, which is one of the places mm -hmm. that I looked at, or whether that is, you know, the golf balls yeah. in Yorkshire. I want to see what things look like because I think that that kind of is ultimately one of the things that I want out of art is I'm really somebody who what I want out of art is things that help us kind of develop a, a visual vocabulary to help us not even understand but just quite literally see the historical moment that we're living in you know and so so for me like there's just like a huge emphasis on like I want to see stuff I want to go there I want to you know, see how these things live in the world, and especially and also in relation to the NSA um, yeah. research, which has been, you know, I've been spending a lot of time looking at this stuff and, and uh, collaborating with people that are working on this, and just the way that I've thought about the internet and communications has like completely changed from really doing this research. A lot of the metaphors that we use to talk about communications and to talk about the internet, we have the cloud, Mm -hmm. the information superhighway, these yeah. very kind of abstract language of placelessness. Um, but it's actually, when you start driving around and looking at it, it becomes very sighted. You know, for uh, me and Thierry were in, in Butte in Cornwall, and it's very funny because that's where all the transatlantic fiber optic cables kind of come on shore into Europe. Sitting right on top is an NSA base. You know, <laughs> in Germany, there's the same thing. There's a, a place in Germany uh, outside Frankfurt. When you look at most of the European fiber optic cables, they all converge in Frankfurt. It's one of the major, I think, the biggest internet exchange in the in 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 Europe. The NSA base sitting on top of it, and so th this stuff starts to become very very tangible. Mm. And I don't think that's generally the way that we um, think about. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think we, we, we have this imagination of borderlessness and kind yeah. of ephemerality. And that sort of thing. But if, if we skip to slide number 12, mm -hmm. there, is, there is still a difficulty in seeing this stuff. So yeah. you're talking about fiber optic cables. Yeah. Here you can't really see, but there's a, <laughs> a spy satellite kind of shooting off into the sky on, on yeah. a long exposure. And this is a good example of the, I guess, the American version of the yeah. men with hills yeah. is that you have this very western kind of rugged landscape yeah. you know it's kind of heroic and it reminds me of all the great photographers but you know yet streaking off into the sky you have this thing which is it is difficult to capture it's difficult yeah. to you know but it's important for you to be there yeah. rather than just for it to become a kind of uh, yeah. you know research project you, you actually have to be there Absolutely. And you, so that's a part of it. And, you know, so this, it's very, it's basically impossible to see in this projection. But, you know, if you look closely, there's a kind of white streak moving across the sky that looks like it doesn't belong. And that's, it's a, it's a reconnaissance satellite that's taking mm -hmm. pictures of the ground. And, and the way that those images are done 
is that I have to track all of the spy satellites that are secret. So you have to work with astronomers and kind of figure out how they work, and you have to learn a bunch of math, and it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> and then you, but once you do all that, you can predict where they'll be in the sky, and yeah. you can try to photograph it. But that's but the, another part of that project too is that that project of seeing. And this is an, another perfect example of that. That that doesn't just happen on a kind of horizontal or spatial axis. In other words, you know, if we're going to look at a place like whether it is, you know, Harrogate or whether it is a drone in the sky or, or a spy satellite in the sky. I feel like when you're producing images, you're not only talking to the people in the present, but you're in a way also learning from your ancestors in a way, in the sense that you're, look, you're also in dialogue mm -hmm. with people who have looked at those landscapes before you and have had a take on what that landscape looked like that was relevant to their historical moment and yeah. is often also relevant to ours, but I feel like you're kind of contributing to the, 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 the creation of a uh, really a kind of vocabulary or kind of visual language that we use to understand the present as well as the past. And you see what you do, in ter I, I can see entirely what you mean in terms of that rather than saying you know, you're working in a kind of political or activist kind of mode because that obviously comes into it um, and is part of the work. But what you're looking for is something perhaps more universal, more general. I mean, I don't, I don't know, for some reason, I think we talked about it previously where you mentioned cubism as being like a different yeah. way of looking at things. Yeah. And I can kind of see how that could have been the early 20th century version of what we're going through. Yeah. Some attempt to quantify or see you know, the world in 360 degrees as it is at that moment. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily, because I, when I talk to artists and I talk to them about the, you know, the political content, some, sometimes they're worried that doing something political will date their work or yeah. will put them, stamp them in a moment in time and you know, we can all go, oh yeah, that was about WikiLeaks and then yeah. like they say, your career's over, Trevor, yeah. let's move on. Yeah. But, yeah. Yours is kind of, you have a longer vision for this. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to shy away from words like universal. I mean, I guess I just kind of have faith that history and seeing and images are cumulative over time. And so in the sense, if we're looking at, you know, rain steam speed, right? I mean, you couldn't think of a painting that was more specific to that historical moment, you mm -hmm. know? And yet, we still see it, and we get something out of it, and we appreciate it, and it speaks to us in the same way that we can go see, you know, Antigone, you know, mm -hmm. plays from thousands of yeah. years ago that still speak to the historical moment that we live in. And I think there is something to the specificities that, um, you know, I'm not interested in making, like, generic, like, timeless art, because I don't mm -hmm. think that exists. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you, that history rhymes, right? And so when we look That's at true, the yeah. ways in which the past mm -hmm. rhymes with the present, there, we can learn from people who have seen things in the past and they still speak to us. And, and you can only assume that the future will look back at this time and the, and the things that we are trying to see now and that it can speak to our descendants or whatever. Mm. I, mean, I don't want to harp on about these secret missions or anything, but well, isn't it quite dangerous <laughs> doing often what you do? Because the idea that you're in the middle of the desert yeah. and you're chasing drones, yeah. Sounds pretty crazy to me. I mean, someone else in the audience mentioned to me that, you know, sometimes you do get into hot water, and there was a time, I guess, you were in an, outside an American base, and they got a bit heavy and said, called in the, <laughs> you know, called in the military, and they go, oh, it's Trevor Paglin. He's my favorite, you know. You're kind of part of that community, but is it yeah. not also, you know, are you pushing boundaries? Are you taking risks? You know, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I generally... Um, Okay, so I kind of have to preface that by saying I'm always very conscious about what the laws are mm -hmm. around what it is that I'm doing. So for example, before we even started working seriously on this project, we talked to a lawyer, it's like, what are the photography laws yeah. in the UK? Because you have to know what that is, because not even people who are doing security at a base, they don't necessarily know yeah. what the hell's going on, they just want to yeah. shut down what it is you're doing. So you kind of have to have a, kind of know where the lines are, and I'm not really interested in crossing that lines, and I'm, and I'm not necessarily I'm not really interested in being provocative for the sake of being provocative. In terms of the danger of what I do, it's far more dangerous to, for me just being stupid, like out in the desert with you know, a flat tire 
and a cell phone that doesn't work mm -hmm. and you know a, you know a cup of water you know that's really what it, it, just me being stupid is, is, is far more dangerous than anything that, I mean, a drone's not going to shoot a hellfire missile at a white guy <laughs> driving a truck in, in, in Nevada yeah. um, but you know but also there is a, you know I, I am white I'm a very you know I'm an American guy and that opens up a kind of space that when I do have interactions with you know security people or something like that, that that's, I, I wouldn't do this work if I you know had a different heritage necessarily. And is, um, is that anything to do with your father, who was also kind of he wasn't in the military, but you guys moved around like yeah in, yeah in no he of, was in the military he was yeah. in the air force and um, I think what that what they, so I grew up uh, around different American bases mm -hmm. around the world mm -hmm. and I think that kind of did two things for me. First of all, it gave me the eyes to see it. Because mm -hmm. in the US, they, you know, if you're not in the military, you would not you would never even see it as a part of your everyday. You wouldn't even understand that the American military and intelligence agencies is a kind of global geography. And mm -hmm. if you're in the American military, you're just as likely to be in Korea or Okinawa or Germany as you are to be in, you know, Tennessee. And in yeah. fact, far more likely. Yeah. You know? Um, so I think it gave me that sense of what the geography of that was. And it also gave me a, um, a kind of comfortability mm -hmm. being around it. In other words, I don't think of it as a kind of a, a set of alien institutions in, the, in, in that way. I don't, for me, there's not a kind of line in my head between, oh, they're over there and I'm over here. It gets much messier. And that, in, in, as you mentioned before, that, that messiness um, happens throughout the work as well because especially when you're looking at things like reconnaissance satellites or, or secret sites um, you're looking at people's jobs and what people's you know endeavors that if you work on classified military projects, you live in a very, very alienated world. Mm -hmm. You can't tell your family what you do for a living. You can't necessarily tell your wife where you go to work every day. This is, you know, there's a tremendous amount of alienation mm -hmm. that that culture can breed. And so what I've experienced from time to time is that people will see the work that I do and be like, oh, somebody noticed. Yeah. <laughs> somebody cares, yeah. you know, and so. So hence the, the, the example that you gave us photographing drones once and then to make a very, very long story short, it turned out that their counterterrorism chief was, had, was a fan of a work that I did. <laughs> He's like, oh my God, they have to Because you, you went, so you he went, cares what we're doing. You, you, know? <laughs> you started collecting these badges yeah. that the, the guys would have different kind of secretive divisions yeah. of, uh, I guess, CIA groups or black ops yeah. groups. That's right. And I mean, I guess they're proud of it that you found these things, or you kind of, you know, yeah, there's yeah. a badge of honor yeah, attached to of. it, or just a kind of recognition. Yeah, that you exist. Know. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think that so that's kind of interesting with, with with in some of the interactions that I've had. But you know, but also to go back to your original question about this this question of of danger and fear, one of the things that 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 I have trouble with, and, and I don't like answering those kind of questions, mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason I don't like really answering those kind of questions is because kind of underlying the question is the assumption that there are these incredibly coercive, extra-legal institutions that we could imagine killing somebody like me. And, and to me, I don't even like to imagine living in a world where we could imagine that that mm -hmm. would be true. Yeah. And of course, maybe that is true, but, but for me, I just kind of insist on being naive and say, no, these are civic institutions. Like the CIA is pretty much the same exact thing as the local library, except that they're in, you know, have a secret budget and they kill people. Yeah. But at the same time, symbolically, you know, the, these should be institutions that, that we as, you know, I say we, I mean, I'm not a British. Well, they're, they're owned by yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know. the, the American context is maybe a little bit different than yeah. the British context here. But yeah, but, but yeah, but in, in, in the US and in democracy in, in general, that's the kind of theory. Mm. Right? Well, um, I just want to flip back to um, slide number three. Mm -hmm. what, what interests me about the, the, the confluence of all these different things you do is somehow that you can cross this world of intelligence or information. You can be in the art world. You know, you, you're sort of doing work that's semi-scientific, geographic, social kind of... Where, where, how do you 
flip between all these communities? Do you feel more aligned to one or the other, or does the art just become part of it? Or you know, which community do you yeah. feel comfortable in? Well, I think you know, at, at, at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day, I'm an artist, and that's what I do, and that's how I make a living, and that's where I spend most of my time. You know, in terms of everyday emails, it's mostly dealing with art stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and and that, that's, but at the same time, I don't, for me that, again, because I'm interested in kind of seeing the world and seeing how the world works, in order to kind of develop the lenses that you need to see other things, I need to look at other disciplines mm -hmm. as well. Um, so I, you know, I have studied geography. I've worked with journalists, but but those um, studies emerged from my desire as an artist to want to develop specialized ways of, of understanding things, or being able to research things, or being able to see things. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's not unique to me at all. Like as an artist, I think most artists would probably tell you that they're, you know, not most artists. Most artists with whom I'm in. A, kind of conversation, yeah. uh, a bigger conversation, would probably say that they're more interested in anthropology than, mm -hmm. than, than art, for example. I mean, this is not, this would not be unusual at all. Um, I've just, a little bit more obsessive, compulsive maybe, maybe took it a little bit further than a lot of people. Well, I think it's, also, it's also fair to say that perhaps I'm not giving the breadth of your kind of different areas of practice enough because you've also worked uh, one of the recent project was called The Last Pictures, yeah. in which you basically blasted images off into space um, on, yeah. board a, on board a, was it a satellite. Yeah, so we, I had to learn so, a, like real yeah, rocket that, science yeah, to do that. Yeah, that's serious that's a pain in the ass. business. But, um, <laughs> so, I had to learn all this math. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to ask the audience to, to jump in. We've got a question here. Do we have a microphone uh, for the lady in the front, please? Thank you. Hello? Can you hear? Hi. Um, I, sorry, I introduced myself. Uh, I'm Juliette Bijou, and I'm a fine artist at Winchester School of Art. Mm -hmm. um, and we all, as you know, attended the Transmediale Conference yes. in Berlin in January, where we exhibited our work, and we were interested in what you did and took it back to uni. And I suppose one of the things that we all were a bit puzzled by is a lot of what you present in your images are very romantic, and mm -hmm, yet yeah. there's this high contradiction. Oh, and yeah. I wonder how you, if you do at all, resolve that. No, I think, I think <laughs> it's a fantastic question, and this is something that, that, I, that, that a lot of people brought up in relation to my work. Is, and, 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 and there's a part of it that kind of amuses me, to be honest with you, um, because I think that the, if the question is, is there a contradiction between a kind of a rhetoric of romanticism in an image and the, is there, are you kind of condoning something politically by using a visual rhetoric of that it has a that it has a history and is a trope, you know? And and I I feel like we're all not all of us, but I think a lot of us are like kind of secretly Platonists, where we really want the beautiful and the good to be the same thing, <laughs> and they're not, you know. And and I think to me that that. It, that's a complication that I'm interested in, intro in introducing in the work, is that the beautiful is not the good. You know, a spy satellite in the sky on a clear night in the middle of the Nevada desert is utterly breathtakingly beautiful. You know, that doesn't mean that it's a wonderful thing that should exist in the universe, you know. And so for me, I guess the kind of aesthetic tradition that that really speaks to directly is this kind of old idea of the sublime, where the sublime is the thing that you are on one hand amazed by and at the same time deeply horrified by and um, that confronts you with the limits of your own uh, perception or your own rationality, you know? And so to me, I guess that's a much more, for me, a, a kind of aesthetically interesting space to inhabit where it is complicated and um, what things look like and what they are seem to contradict each other and um, yeah it, it and but it's also a kind of I, as I was saying there's historical conversations that I'm kind of trying to contribute to 
as well as the fact that I want to look at images, right? And I don't, I don't think that if you make a like, bad image that it's more objective or something. I mean, objectivity is itself a kind of aesthetic trope in, in, in images. You know, so um, I guess I'm pretty freewheeling with that and I like playing with that a lot, you know. Another question, anyone? Throw your hand up. Ah, here. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if you could say anything about whether we're kind of doomed to repeat our forgetting of these kind of instances and whether are we in a period of uh, kind of media hype at the minute and is that going to die down or, or do you see something else happening? Yeah, I mean, this, this question of forgetting is, is interesting. I mean, and it, it's, I think there's a lot more to it than that, in the sense that I, I guess, I'm, I don't think that public perception or what we all pay attention to or what we believe necessarily has anything to do with how the structures that societies, that run societies work. Right, so for example, in Germany right now, you have something like 75% of Germans are supporting uh, serious constraints on, on the NSA surveillance in Germany and giving asylum to Edward Snowden. You have, again, also in the US, like vast majorities of when you do polls show like people say Snowden is a, is a hero, for example. However, that doesn't necessarily, that's not gonna translate into policy changes or kind of structural changes or um, economic changes necessarily, I mean, it's a part of it, but I think it is, um, I think we put too much faith in our, in the ability of, or our ability to change things by perceiving them differently, right? I think perceiving them differently is, is a part of that, or paying attention to them is part of that, but I think it in and of itself is in a, insufficient. Um, so are, are we doomed to, repeat the past, I, I don't think it's a repeating the past. I think that the, the, the past is cumulative, right? In the sense that we didn't, the structures that will exist tomorrow are built on the foundations that were laid today, which are built on foundations that were laid, you know, years ago. And so I, I think about history and political structures in much more, an almost kind of geologic sense where they're kind of sedimented on top of each other. And if you really want to change them, you have to think about getting some blasting caps out and getting some dynamite and trying to blow them up rather than just looking at them differently. Yeah, and I don't, I don't mean that literally. Like I'm not advocating bombing or something like that. In order, uh, but, um, but kind of metaphorically, I think thinking about actually trying to dismantle structures rather than, um, than simply it being sufficient to pay attention to them. Some of that is going on with the WikiLeaks. It's forcing politicians yeah. to become accountable. Like you said, it's not going to change the fact that yeah. Germany have these enormous yeah. bases, the biggest yeah. bases in Europe. But yeah. anyway, Trevor will be here to remind us of these things in five years' time when it becomes <laughs> relevant again or timely. Uh, another question? Are you going to? Oh, right over here at the back, gentlemen. Yeah, I was just um, wondering what your thoughts on Argus's and other wide area surveillance um, systems such as that. On, on what one? On Argus is. Are oh, the Argus the blimps you mean? Yeah. Yeah, oh, okay, so that, that's a, a, a fantastic question. It's actually something I've been looking at a lot recently. Um, this is, okay, the so Argus system is one of a number of what are called persistent surveillance systems. And the idea behind a persistent surveillance system is that you can either fly a blimp or drones or manned aircraft or you set up a tower. Um, the long and the short of it is that cameras have gotten good enough where you can take extremely high resolution images of cities, like where you can literally photograph everything that happens in the city and real time. And storage has gotten cheap enough that you can actually store this stuff. So you can, uh, you know, they've had one over Kabul forever. They're, 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 they have these pilot projects in different places and, and there's now private companies that are trying to do this as well where you can literally park a blimp over a city and just record everything, wow. period, that yeah. happens in, in, the, in the city. And what's remarkable, I mean, there's a number of obviously like kind of basic privacy concerns that go into that, but I think that we are entering a historical moment where 
we are increasingly have a kind of power over time, right? And I really think that, you know, in the 19th century, we, sometimes you can think about the, the, the technological changes of the 19th century are often characterized as the, uh, the annihilation of space with time, meaning things like the railroads, Turner, mm -hmm. uh, Telegraph, um, yeah. you know, sped up, uh, actually collapsed space in very, very dramatic ways in the sense that you go from taking a train from New York City to California, that trip goes from being the better part of a year to a few days. And this happens in the course of several decades. Mm -hmm. And this is just orders of magnitude uh, that the practical distances of, 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 of things have, have collapsed. Mm -hmm. right? and th nothing like this has happened since. You know, in the 19th century was really, the, 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 those kinds of changes have, we have not seen yet. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps in the 21st century, we might see something like the, the annihilation of time with space. In other words, what does it mean to be building seeing machines and uh, surveillance apparatuses that allow us to rewind time and potentially to fast forward time in the, in the terms of, the, there's a huge amount of work being done in terms of predictive algorithms mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And, and you really see a huge, um, effort and a lot of research and a lot of technologies being deployed that that are really about time travel you know and and the kind of mastery over time and, and so it's something i've been paying a lot of attention to and just trying to understand for myself and these it's very things, bizarre stuff these things are also quite hidden the way you're talking about them you know they're not manifestly obvious like the golf balls you know these are things that yeah. are happening kind of in different structures, yeah. you know, they're not necessarily going to build more superstructures yeah, for us to exactly. see these things. They're ha happening yeah. ever more kind of meta yeah. ways. So the, with the balloons, they, they test them. They have this weird little secret base in Utah, which I've, I've photographed as well, and the, the balloons in the sky. But a lot of it is happening through uh, private companies and is actually, it's just insinuated into other systems, like, for example, cell phone towers that, you know, not only uh, will record your, you know, uh, route your phone calls, but that keep a record of where everybody with a cell phone was, you know, period. You know, so, uh, and so a lot of them are integrated into existing systems on the back end. And they're actually really tricky to research, as you can imagine, a lot of the companies that develop this stuff don't really want it, uh, you know, broadcast uh, what they're doing. So that's been a little bit of a trick in terms of doing some of this work. Uh, any more questions before we wrap up? Uh, another one over there. I'll come to you as well. Um, I saw your exhibition at the Setacion in Vienna. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, I was really struck how seductive yeah. uh, the images were. And I think oh. the earlier comment about the you know, romanticism maybe didn't speak to me as much as um, the way you were handling the surface um, in such a careful and um, seductive way, uh, the way you were maybe really making us kind of come closer to something that was so far away, mm -hmm. and in fact making us pay attention to the surface in order to possibly think how difficult it is to see something so far away. So I, I was wondering about seduction in your work and in the kind of material um, presence that, that you give to seduction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I yeah, it's like Caravaggio, right? <laughs> I mean, no, but I mean, I, I, I think it's similar to this, this question about the sublime is like that, that kind, kind of wanting to look closer and even though you and you can look closer, but when you do, then there's almost like another door, like something else presents itself. And it's almost like moving towards something that is regressing infinitely from your own vision. And, you know, that, and that's a kind of allegory, but that's also like, like literally true, what happens in some of the images, like let's look at number 10, for example, um, which are, uh, you know, so this is a photograph of an American this is a, a secret airbase in Nevada that one of the projects I've done for many, many years is take pictures of 
uh, secret installations from, from great distances, and this is particularly um, in the US where this kind of thing goes on. Um, these are installations where oftentimes there's no place where you can stand on public land and even see it with your eyes. These are out in the desert, massive restricted uh, areas around them. You can't get anywhere near them at all. Um, so, so these are images that are shot with telescopes that are very, very powerful in, in, in trying to see these places. But of course, the further that you look, the more atmospheric distortion that you get and the more heat and the haze and the more that literally the physical properties of vision themselves collapse. You know, and so I think that that is another kind of trope that, that, that emerges in, in the work is that, that trying to see that um, and having the thing that you're trying to see like running away from you in, in as might happen in the kind of seductive kind of uh, situation. And, and so, um, so yeah, that's definitely something that I'm trying to get across or try to convey in the work or try to invite a viewer into that kind of relationship for sure. Uh, we've got one more question down here. Um, I was just wondering more a kind of practical question of you're kind of putting your hand up and, and saying look at this sort of this stuff which yeah is there for people to look at if they mm -hmm. want to but do you ever feel like some sort of authorities want to discourage you from from doing that or do you feel like you're quite free to yeah no I feel like I you know I think that that I am quite free to do that I mean that's what I do <laughs> I mean um so yeah, I mean, I think that with any kinds of projects, some people get upset, some people don't get upset. I mean, that's just how any conversation with your family works, you know? So I mean, I, I, don't, I, I don't shy away from that necessarily. Um, but yeah, I've never, but, but again, it's, it's very, I'm not being provocative for the sake of being provocative. I'm really not interested in that. I'm really just interested in like, let's see what the world looks like. You know, and you know, with the with the project here for the underground, for example, like this is like actually really straightforward. This is just a picture of Yorkshire. That's really what it is, <laughs> you know. And so it's 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 kind of fun in, in in that way to where it's I'm not I'm not provoking anything at all. I mean, it's just very simply say like no, let's look right there, and that's pretty much all there is to it, you know. Just building off of that, where um, you've now come to England to do a project, and I know you've traveled widely for your work, but do you, would you contemplate doing what you do in, in other countries? I'm thinking about your question earlier um, about, you know, could you do this in Russia or China? No, yeah. you would, yeah, yeah, you no, would no, no. be yeah. shot or, yeah. you know, imprisoned. Yeah, and those are totalitarian countries that... Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to mess with. <laughs> they, well, and also that... I'm not responsible for in a yeah. way, you okay. know? Well, it just remains for me to thank Trevor for opening some of these secrets up about satellites and drones and temporarily blowing my mind with this predicting my future thing, which I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't quite get my head around. And um, I urge you all to go and see his installation as soon as you can in Gloucester Road. And just to say thank you, Trevor, for coming tonight. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so much for, for, for doing this. Thank you.